I want to continue the study we actually started last Sunday morning concerning fellowship. I wish that all of us could appreciate more the great fellowship members of the church have because of and on the basis of the fact that we have been forgiven of our sins and our obedience to the gospel and being baptized to Christ for the remission of sins and being added, you might say, to that fellowship, to the church, that we might be certainly a people fully aware of the charges God has laid upon us that we can be all that God wanted us to be is the leavening for good in the world, the light of the world, and all such things as God has in the New Testament charged the church to do, which we've labored to point out is the fundamental idea and definition of fellowship. Fellowship is working for the Lord, doing what the Lord wants us to do. We're in partnership with God. God charged the church to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He wants everybody to be saved, 2 Peter 3, 9, verses following. And yet salvation is by people having heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel. Well, who is charged with getting that gospel out to every creature and every generation? It's the church. We have a marvelous partnership with God Almighty. We don't have to doubt Him doing His part. What we have to recognize is that we must be faithful to the New Testament teaching that we'll be able to do our part, which, as I said, is primarily working for the Lord. So who is a Christian? A child of God. A member of the spiritual body of Christ. A citizen of the kingdom of heaven. It's been disclosed from God's great word, the scriptures, that the disciple, remember a disciple is a learner, a follower, one who's willing to be taught and learn God's will for his life. That that person must become an obedient believer in order for that person to be saved from sin. That person to become an obedient believer must be willing to repent of one's sins and then complete his obedience to the gospel by being immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I might point out there that being baptized, as the King James says, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Your fine American standard says baptized into. Baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's interesting because we're talking about fellowship. We talked about this morning being baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27 when one is baptized for unto the remission or forgiveness of sins. But what you have in Matthew 28, in Matthew's account of the Great Commission, when he says you're baptized in the King James in the name of Father, Son, why did the translators of the American Standard, why did they render it into rather than in? Because what is being said in Matthew 28 is that one is baptized, listen, into a saved relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, Acts 2 and verse 38, Peter says to believers in Christ, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name. Now, the other word is in. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or rather, in the name of, of Jesus Christ. Now, what you have is, is Acts 2, 38, Jews who already believe in God. Now they've been brought to belief in Jesus Christ of Nazareth as a son of God and the only Savior. They must therefore by the authority of Jesus Christ be baptized for the remission of sins. But to be baptized by the authority of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins is to be baptized into a saved relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's what both those passages put together are actually teaching. When one is baptized to obtain remission or forgiveness of sins, having first believed in Christ, and before that having heard the gospel so they could believe in Christ, then repenting of sins, confessing one's faith in Christ, now they can be baptized for the remission of sins. How? By the authority of Christ. But it's baptized into a saved relationship with the Godhead three. And that's a point that ought to be remembered because we're talking about fellowship. And when I'm baptized into a saved relationship, I'm talking about reconciled to God. I was estranged from Him by my sins, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23. But having heard the gospel and understand it, 
Then as Paul reminded the Romans in Romans 6, 17, and 18, But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, which he discusses earlier in the chapter, a form of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You have obeyed that form of doctrine, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. So when you're freed from sins and being baptized for the remission of sins, then you're reconciled to God. You're baptized into a saved relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's important to understand. One thereby becomes a child of God, a member of the family of God, a member of the Lord's church. They're one in the same thing. Every person then who is, and we've just discussed how, born of water and the Spirit, John 3, 3, and 5, is a child of God. One must be born of water and the Spirit. Well, it's the Holy Spirit who revealed the New Testament. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. He does His work in convicting men of sin, converting them to Christ, and keeping them saved in the church through His sword, which is His instrument, which is the Word of God. Men learn what to do to be saved. Men learn what to do in the church to remain saved. So a citizen of the kingdom has a work to do in the kingdom. There's citizen work to do. Obviously then, at that time, the moment one becomes a Christian, when one's baptized to Christ, when one's baptized to a saved relationship, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, obviously that person is in full, complete fellowship with God and with Christ and all others who have obeyed the gospel and remain faithful to God. And no one enjoys that fellowship unless they are obedient to the gospel. And that's a very important point to keep in mind. That's why the plan of salvation is so significant, so important. It's the beginning place. It's the place where you start out as a child of God, all past sins forgiven. Now, this question, does that person always, because once in fellowship, always in fellowship with God and other Christians, because he is a child of God, a member of God's family? Well, all you have to do is read most of the New Testament and find out the answer to that is no. People can live for a while faithful to God and then give up faithful living, and they cut their fellowship off with God. If that were true, that is, once in fellowship, always in fellowship, then the doctrine of impossibility of apostasy is true. That is, a child of God cannot so sin as to be eternally lost. And that's just not true. The Bible nowhere teaches that. Such as in Galatians 5 and verse 4. Whosoever you are that are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Remember what we said earlier about uh, fellowship? It involves not only right conduct, but it involves pure doctrine. Well, those people in those days were being told that, yes, you can be saved by Christ. He is the Messiah. He's the only Savior. And you must believe in him, repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, be baptized for the remission of sins, but then you must be circumcised, keep the law. Well, that's adding too much. God never bound that upon children of God. And he says, if you attempt today under the authority of Christ in the New Testament to be justified by the law of Moses, when Colossians 2 and verse 14 says God took it out of the way, nailed it to the cross, and called it the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, contrary to us, then he says, if you attempt to approach God under the law when it's been taken away because it's fulfilled its purpose, you've fallen from the favor of God. That, that Galatian epistle, you know, is written to several different churches, the churches of Galatia. So at least one can uh, fall from grace by keeping one false doctrine. Now it sounds to me that if you keep any false doctrine, if you do anything contrary to God's will as doctrine pertaining to living the Christian life, you're not going to remain in the favor of God that all faithful Christians enjoy. Because to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins is to put one in a state of grace, a state of favor. The church of our Lord is an institution of favored people. God favors them because they would hear the truth and understand the truth. They were honest with the truth and they would obey the truth no matter what it took for them to do it. The terms of Christian fellowship in the first century New Testament church, having become children of God, 
including continuing in the apostles' doctrine, Acts 2, verse 42. That's what's involved. The very day the Lord's church began, as you have recorded in Acts 2, Christian fellowship was begun. You know, if the church began on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, as recorded in your Bible in Acts 2, then fellowship through Christ with the Lord started at that same time. Because the church is composed of people who are in fellowship with God. And that's a very important point, as we've already been studying. So, the day the Lord's church began, Christian fellowship began. And that fellowship was predicated upon the apostles' teaching. And that's the doctrine of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Christ. The Bible says of those who heard believed and obeyed the word being baptized for unto the remission of sins that they were added to the church acts 2 38 41 and 47 and the bible says plainly and they can said you and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine apostles teaching and fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers and all that believed were together. That's fellowship. Of the same mind and the same judgment on matters pertaining to becoming a Christian and in living the Christian life. They had all things common. And, of course, the Lord added the church daily, such as should be saved. Acts 2, 47. And then notice in Acts 2, 42, 44, and 46 particularly, that they were continuing steadfastly, notice, with one accord. And that doesn't mean they simply had a Japanese car. It means that they had the same mind. And they had the same judgment. And they had the same understanding that God through the New Testament can put in anybody's mind. If they'll let the New Testament be the sole authority for whatever they believe in practice. The plea of our brethren of almost 200 years ago in seeking to restore ancient, pure, primitive New Testament Christianity was we don't need man-made creed books. We don't need man-made disciplines. We don't need man-made catechisms. We don't need the councils and such of men to make laws to set each denomination apart from the other. The idea was we have one God and one Christ and one Bible. Why do we need anything but that? And if we have that, why can't we be Christians? Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Members of the church that Jesus built, of which everybody can read about in their own Bible and read of its beginning in Acts 2. You ask people today, well, of what church are you a member? Now, they have a denominational mindset. They think that's Christianity. It's the furthest thing from New Testament Christianity. Somebody says, um, Mr. Brown, or if they know me very well, say David. <laughs> of what church are you a member? And if I were to answer them, I'm a member of the church that Jesus purchased with his blood. What do you think they would think about that? Oh, they, no, 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 no. What church do, do you hold membership? Uh, the one Jesus built. Well, what church is that? It's the body of Christ. Every one of those are scriptural terms. I'm going to give you a Bible for what you ask. But because you have a concept, there's one great, single, solitary, invisible church made up of all of the different denominations, and one chooses God and Christ to be saved and ask Christ to save him, then they pick a church to suit themselves. Now that's denominationalism. Nowhere taught in your New Testament. It's not there. It goes against everything Jesus prayed for about unity. It goes against everything the Bible teaches about the Lord's church. Well, how do you have that church today? Follow the divine pattern. And in every age, men can be Christians and Christians only, not hyphenated Christians. Never was such a thing as that, except for God and the Bible. Members of the church of which you can read about. I'm not asking you to accept it from me. Read your Bible. Now, if people would do that and believe this is God talking to me in these words and I must accept it, well, they'd give up denominationalism. And so there was a plea many years ago, let's return to the Bible and Bible only. For the Bible only will make Christians only and the only Christians. Now, tell me something. What's wrong with that? 
There's not a thing wrong with it. In fact, everything about it's right. Because the Bible supports it. You read of Jesus saying, I will build my church. C-H-U-R-C-H singular one. How long must you go to school to understand that? The problem is people are drilled in man-made concepts. And mom and daddy believed it. Grandpa and -and so-and-so believed it. And we just can't do it. I mean, it's worked for them. It should work to me. Give me that old-time religion and all this stuff. I don't want any old-time religion, but what is as old as the New Testament. I want that to form my view of everything of Christianity, and especially the fellowship that exists in the church. You realize you can't have fellowship with God if you don't have the church of God? Because that's where the fellowship obtains. If you don't have the church Jesus built that he purchased with his blood, to which he adds every person he saves, you can't have fellowship as God intends people to have fellowship. Because there's got to be Christians first. As the Bible defines Christians and uses it. So they continued. They started and they continued. Steadfastly. They were determined. You do anything steadfastly and you're determined with it. And it was steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Don't, can't we have, if we can have the apostles' doctrine, and we do, we can have the apostles' fellowship. Go back and read John, 1 John 1, and he's saying now, as we apostles have fellowship with God, I'm writing this so you can have fellowship with us who have fellowship with God. Now, that's the same Bible we have right now that they had then. It's been around 2,000 years. Their Christian fellowship was predicated upon their continuing in the apostles' doctrine. Leave living according to the apostles' doctrine, and you leave fellowship with God and fellowship for everybody else. It remains in fellowship with God. The divine record states, all that believed were together. Think about that for a minute. Wouldn't that be wonderful if all these churches around about the country could say that same thing? And why don't they want to? That's what's said of the very first church of our Lord when it was established that they had all things common. All that believed were together. That's not the case with the denominationalism. In fact, they even brag about it. Oh, you can go over here and get what you want, or if you don't like that, you can go over here and get your, uh, what you want. And you, Well, you can go over here and find it if these two don't work. Just so you believe in Christ and call on God through Christ. That's all you need to do. Well, I'll accept that if you can show me in the Bible where such a thing is taught. Their belief was based upon the Word of God alone. Not subjected feelings. Not some sort of personal experiences. Nor any kind of opinions of men. The inspired apostle declared that belief comes by hearing the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. We quote that so much because it's so vital to becoming a Christian. Sometimes think we don't really realize what we're saying. Why is a person's belief or faith the same? Because it's all produced by the same gospel. And it doesn't read one way to Eric and read another way to me, another way completely different for both of us to Gary and then different completely to Buddy and on through to everybody has his own gospel. And yet we hold up one Bible and say all that different stuff came out of this one book. You realize what a reflection that is upon God who gave it to us. That just doesn't make a lick of sense. So, as they continued in the apostles' doctrine only, and they did it every day, day by day, then they continued in Christian fellowship day by day. And all that believed were together. Consider this. They were all together. Because they were all taught the same doctrine. They obeyed the same doctrine. They practiced the same teaching. Those early Christians were not teaching different doctrines that contradicted one another. They were not members of different churches organized in different ways and all the different things that go along with the different denominational groups. They were members of the Lord's church only. Why does one want to be a member of any other church other than the church Jesus shed his blood to purchase? The one that Jesus promised to build. 
The one that you read of in your own Bible in Acts chapter 2. No member of the church of Christ wrote that. But if you're faithful in the church, you'll teach it. You'll practice it. They were only members of the Lord's church. And that was true, genuine fellowship in Christ. They were in fellowship with God. Thus, they were in fellowship with Christ and the Holy Spirit and every human being who had believed and obeyed the same doctrine and were living in harmony with the teachings of the New Testament concerning Christian conduct. They were in fellowship with then each other. There were no split levels of fellowship. Some worshiping God one way. Uh, some worshiping God another way. You see, that's impossible. If we continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. It's only when you deviate from the apostles' doctrine that you got this one running that way and running this way and doing this and that and the other. All those things contradicting one another. It should never be forgotten that the apostle Paul warned that if any preacher preach any other doctrine or gospel than that which is apostolic doctrine or teaching. How serious is God about this? And he said the curse of God would rest upon him. Galatians 1, 6 through 9. Doctrine is important. Don't let anybody tell you it is not. There can be no fellowship. Well, you can't even become a Christian. There can be no fellowship between Christians. You won't even know how God views fellowship. If you just think you can water down the gospel, compromise it, and alter it some way or the other. Now, if the curse of God rests upon any preacher who preaches a different gospel, which means a, a gospel of a different kind from the gospel of Christ, such as was preached on the day of Pentecost. Obviously, they were without God's fellowship. Now, would, would those who follow such perverted teaching be in the same position of fellowship as those who do follow the truth, the complete truth, all the truth of the gospel regarding who becomes a Christian, who is a Christian, and where God puts them when they're obedient and become a Christian, that is being baptized into Christ, and how they live their lives in the church. How could a person who's in fellowship and uh, practicing error be in fellowship with God, who is in no way identified with that error or errors? This is a very serious mistake. And yet there are some members of the church who teach such a thing. Doctrinal error is a cause of disfellowship just as much as moral turpitude. Remember moral turpitude as we defined it this morning is one's conduct. It's almost unbelievable that some of God's people for some years now in a very weak and insipid effort to justify fellowship with brethren in error are contending that there are two levels of Christian fellowship. One, and you don't hear about it much now, but it's still out there. One, the upper level of fellowship. And so they call that Big F, capital F, fellowship. That's the one you got to be concerned about. If you enjoy the capital letter fellowship, I don't get in your Bible, you can't find it in there. Then you don't have to be concerned about little F, Fellowship, Because the upper level fellowship, those are the things you must do to be saved. And the lower level of fellowship, that's just what you like and it's traditional and doesn't really make any difference. There's a problem with all of that. Not found in the Bible. Not found in the Bible at all. There's one fellowship. And that's simply among those whom the Lord has added to his church and live faithful to all things God requires of people in the church. This perversion is an attempt to qualify what we call the seven ones presented by Paul in Ephesians 4, verses 4 and 5. Now there's God's platform for unity. We'll have occasion to get into that more sometime later. But if you want to see the seven planks in God's platform for unity, just read Ephesians 4. And you can find it. This so-called upper-level fellowship includes members of the church who subscribe to 
the seven ones, while the lowercase fellowship only means endorsement. It is affirmed. That's what they claim. You, you can't find that. I don't mind stating it. That's what they believe and they teach it. But there is nothing in the New Testament that teaches it. It's foreign to Colossians 3.17, which says, Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is an absolute contradiction to what John had to say in 2 John verses 9 through 11. Those passages declare plainly that one who goes beyond the teaching of Christ, the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. There's no upper level, no middle level, or lower level. It's just fellowship as the New Testament defines and uses it for members of the church. Furthermore, for one to endorse a false teacher who does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, how can you appeal to Ephesians 4, 4 through 6? When you endorse somebody like that, you're endorsing one that partakes of evil works, of evil deeds. Why are they evil? They're contrary to the teaching of Christ concerning what we believe and practice. He's guilty of evil works. The uppercase fellowship, the lowercase fellowship. How will we sum it up? Foolishness. Contrary to the doctrine of Christ. It just doesn't exist. There's one fellowship that is acceptable to God. We've studied how you obtain that fellowship as an individual becoming a Christian. We've studied how the early church understood that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, Acts 2.42. And notice they continued. That's something they started and they persisted on the same path with it. And they didn't give it up. Continued steadfastly. It's something they kept they were not going to be moved away from it. Now, for a moment, let's consider the disfellowship involved in some of the churches of the first century. We, we sometimes say New Testament times. As they related to what I said earlier, because this is where fellowship is found, moral turpitude, that is, the kind of life you live, the actions you are involved in, and doctrinal error. What you teach is contrary to the gospel of Christ. And you know, if you look to the last book of the Bible, book of Revelation, if you look at chapters 2 and 3, you find letters written to the seven churches of Asia. To the churches at Ephesus, Pergamum, Thyatira, and Laodicea, the inspired apostle John wrote about their moral sins and their doctrinal transgressions. Look at the church at Ephesus. They were children of God, saving their past sins as we've discussed from the Bible. One is saved from past sins and become Christians. Ephesians 1, 7, chapter 2, 1 through 10, and Acts 20 and verse 28. But notice that the scripture says some had left their first love, and it says they had fallen. We find the Lord by the Spirit through the apostle John saying, I have this against thee, that thou didst leave thy first love. Remember, therefore, whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I come to thee and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Well, there's a remedy here somewhere. And what was that remedy? Well, just ignore the transgressions and consider everybody in fellowship with God. That is, ignore the transgressions that all the big wigs in the church say they don't make any difference. We shouldn't divide over that. Whoever the big wigs are. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus who built the church, who purchased the church, who adds to the church, who gives the way people are living the church, who warns us of being judged on the final day by his word which we have before us now. Jesus, the only mediator between God and man, the man who ever liveth to make intercession for us. He said, repent. And he said, repent or else. you believe he loved that church when he said that? Do you believe that he told them what they absolutely needed to hear in order to be saved? If he didn't, look at the other alternative. Then look at the church at Pergamum. Their status before the Lord involved both moral character and doctrinal purity. 
immorality of fornication and false teaching concerning Balaam, Balak, and those we don't know much about, the Nicolaitans. The old preacher said one time, I don't know much about them, but I know they were in trouble. They could only lay nickels on. Now I got your attention, we go on something serious. They were charged with holding to the false teaching of Balaam and Balak and the Nicolaitans. Leading some, whatever those doctrines were, especially the Nicolaitans, we know about Balaam and Balak. It was causing the members of the church to sacrifice to idols and to commit fornication and think that they're just as fine as anybody could be in the eyes of God. He warned, repent therefore. Or else I come to thee quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. The consequences? Fellowship or non-fellowship? Just overlook these things, say we love everybody. Maybe in time they'll all come out of it, but let's not disrupt anybody. That wasn't what Jesus said. He said repent or else. We come to the church in Thyatira. Again, the charges, moral character, fornication, and doctrinal purity. He talked about Jezebel teaching, Jezebel's teaching and influence. If you know the Old Testament, you know how wicked Ahab's wife was, queen of Israel, Jezebel. So here's such a person here. You got either fellowship or not fellowship. What are you going to do? All under a banner of long-suffering and grace and mercy and love. We'll just keep putting up with it. Or we understand the truth about all those words. And we want the church to be of one mind and one judgment. 1 Corinthians 1.10 And we don't want to fellowship that which we left when we repented individually and when we were added to the church. The church is to be pure and holy. It's not just a house of ill repute which some would make it he says I have this against thee you mean the Lord can have something against a church well he said he did I have this against thee that thou sufferest the woman Jezebel who called herself a prophetess and she teacheth and seduceth my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols and I gave her time that she should repent and she willeth not to repent of her fornication Revelation 2 18 through 22 Notice again the consequences. Repent. Repent. He says, except they repent. And all the churches shall know that I am he that searcheth the reins and hearts and will give unto each one of you according to your works. Now who would say that they were in fellowship with Christ? With the members of the church. He's addressed this church said, here's how some of you are living. Inspiration is plainly declaring they did not continue in fellowship with Christ by these evil works, whether it be evil conduct or false teaching. But look at the church at Laodicea. To them the Lord said, So because thou art lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. And you heard preachers point out plainly, spew there means vomit. They were... Furthermore accused, thou art the wretched one and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And the result of all this, a spiritual, sad spiritual condition, our Lord admonished them, be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Revelation 3, 14 through 20. There's much there we could spend time on, but won't now. In the case, this particular case, the Lord Jesus is pictured as on the outside, knocking on the door for entrance. Now, he'll never force that door. The people on the inside must be willing to open that door to him. Christian fellowship? How can how can Christ be in fellowship with him? He's on the outside looking in, asking for entrance. Which implies they must be willing to comply with his will and open the door. Then he will come in. So from these Bible patterns or examples, is it not evident that simply because one becomes a Christian is not enough? One must be 
faithful to the Lord in order to remain in fellowship with Him and every other faithful member of the Lord's church. There are some questions. Does the Lord fellowship false teaching? But not fellowship fornication. Does the Lord fellowship fornication? But not fellowship drunkenness. Does the Lord fellowship drunkenness? But not fellowship idolatry. But here's what God's good word says. It's been saying it for 2,000 years. And if the world lasts another 2,000 years, it'll be saying it 2,000 years from now, right there to the day of judgment. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate homosexuals, nor abusers themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Read Galatians 5. You find these things fall into the works of the flesh, which he makes clear people who engage in such things will inherit the kingdom of God. So what about today, folks? Right now, this hour, as far as this church is concerned and every other church, every other Christian, should the church fellowship those members who are guilty of such sins or any other sin? The scriptures are clear. And they are authoritative. Members of the Lord's church, children of God, members of the body of Christ, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, guilty of such sins, who continue in them, who will not repent, are not in fellowship with God. They are lost and they are in need of repentance. And they will be lost eternally if they do not repent. Being restored to fellowship by their own repentance, confession of those sins and praying God for forgiveness. Should the church fellowship those whom the Lord Jesus Christ does not fellowship? The mistake of the mistaken is evident, even in the Lord's church. So you see, when you study about fellowship as it's presented in the New Testament, the relationship that members of the church have one with another, it's all predicated upon their conduct and what they believe in matters of doctrine. And you can be wrong in both cases, one or the other, or both. Do we want to be the pure church the New Testament says we must be? It will be when every one of us is seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things should be added unto us. It will be when living as the New Testament teaches in every area of our life will be the most important thing there is on earth to us. Because it's only to those people we are steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Is it said, well done on the day of judgment. Good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. Let us so labor, brethren, in the fellowship that's taught in the Bible, that exists between God's people, that heaven will be our home. But it will be because we're steadfast and we labor in it day by day to be obedient to God's truths relative to Christian living and showing God that we love Him by obeying His commandments. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, we plead with you to seriously consider the simple, plain plan of salvation that all men must believe and from the heart obey in order for them to be forgiven of sins, being baptized into Christ, and thus a member of the church that Jesus built and He purchased with His blood. We've studied several times throughout the sermon on what one must believe and do to become a Christian. If you need to do that, we plead with you this afternoon not to leave this building before you're reconciled to God and saved from your past sins. For the resolve to be faithful the rest of your life. If as a child of God, you honestly with God view your heart in the light of His Word, and you see you're letting things creep in, maybe they've taken up rest there, then you need to fully repent of those sins that you might once again be enjoying faithfulness in the kingdom of God. God knows your heart. God knows our thoughts and motives and practices. And what is your answer to Him? Do you need to repent and confess those sins and pray for forgiveness? Whatever your need that is a salvation need, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.